start as soon as they bring the governor out in the hall, or as soon as the mayor arrives, or both. This hearing for the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform to come to order. Today's hearing concerns the ongoing forced closure crisis that has left tens of millions of American homeowners without the important piece of the American dream. Today's hearing is but another hearing and continuation that this committee has looked into since 2007. Long before the economic meltdown, Americans were finding the American dream escaping on them. Back in 2007, this committee went to Cleveland, Ohio, where for a number of years, home prices had stopped going up and were beginning to go down at a frightening rate. As a result, homeowners who had purchased homes with little or no money down and or been laid off found themselves losing their home. As a result, communities were beginning to be boarded up as communities were boarded up, the cycle began to escalate with home values going down. All of this began without an economic world meltdown, but it foretold many things that we now see here today. The fact is, the American home mortgage system was designed based on an assumption that homes would never go down in value. All of us know better today that you can have a national deflation among homes that ultimately, if you lose your job, you will not be able to keep a home that was highly leveraged. So as we hear from witnesses, beginning with the state's governor, we want this committee to realize that government plays a part in it, but that there are other factors that always will supersede even government's best intentions. This committee has begun and continues to look at camps, success or failure, and the uh, various government agencies, including Freddie and Fannie, that failed to secure the dollars that they were supposed to in order to be prepared for downtimes. This committee came to Baltimore today at the request of the ranking member. He has worked diligently on the issue of home foreclosures and continues to be a voice on the committee for further investigation. With that, I recognize the ranking member for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, Chairman I said I want to thank you for convening today's hearing, and I welcome you and the other members of the committee uh, to my hometown in Baltimore. I want to welcome Governor O'Malley and Mayor Rawlings when she arrives. And I want to thank you, uh, Mr. Governor, for your leadership and you, uh, Mr. Isaac, for yours. Thanks also to the University of Maryland School of Law and I, alma mater, for hosting us all here today and to Associate Dean uh, Master and Ed Fisher and certainly uh, to Dean Phoebe Snowden. If I had the pleasure, please. Sorry. Mr. Chairman, we are in the grips of a nationwide foreclosure crisis. In 2009, there were about 2.8 million foreclosures across the country. Last year, there were 2.9 million. And this year, there may be more than 3 million.
This week, researchers at Johns Hopkins University here in Baltimore prepared a report for the committee called The Impact of Foreclosure Waves on the City of Baltimore. I ask that this report be made a part of the official hearing without objection. So the report finds that between 2008 and 2010, there were more than 11,000 foreclosures in the city of Baltimore alone. And most families, uh, and, and of course families, more than $1.5 billion. The foreclosure crisis is a wrecking ball smashing through <coughs> communities across the nation. And Baltimore is one example of that disruption. <coughs> This crisis not only threatens our nation's economic recovery, making it harder to reduce unemployment and spread economic <coughs> growth, it also drains state and local budgets that rely on property tax revenues for schools, police, and emergency services. It destroys neighborhoods and devastates families, and it harms individuals. It is a national crisis with very local consequences. What is so frustrating is that this crisis is being aggravated by actions of mortgage servicing companies that conduct foreclosures. There are no national standards for these companies, and they have engaged in the systematic abuses across the country. In our committee's first hearing this year, Inspector General Matark testified that the performance of mortgage servicing companies has been, and I quote, abysmal. He also said this, and I quote, from the repeated loss of borrowed paperwork to blatant failure to follow program standards to unnecessary delays that severely harm borrowers while benefiting servicers themselves, stories of servicer negligence and misconduct of legion, end of quote. These companies have signed false affidavits by the tens of thousands, inflated fees, performed illegal actions against military service members and veterans, and aggressively pursued foreclosures when modifications made more sense and were already underway. This court system does not work for homeowners, and it does not work for state and local governments. It does not even work for mortgage investors who want to salvage their investments through loan modifications rather than foreclosures. The Association of Mortgage Investors, which represents private investors, pension funds, universities, and endowments, reports that investors have suffered material losses as a result of faulty and in inefficient at in times in proper servicing of mortgage loans. <clears throat> it seems that the only ones who support this flawed system are the ones with their hands on the lever of the wrecking ball, the mortgage servicing companies. They are swinging it more recklessly each year, and we cannot stem this damage unless we hold them accountable. Mr. Chairman, our committee is taking a great first step today by hearing about the state and local impact of foreclosure crisis. When we return to Washington, I hope we will be able to hear directly from the mortgage servicing companies themselves. I want to thank you, and again, I want to welcome uh, the mayor. It's good to have you here. With that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. All members will have five legislative days in which to uh, include opening statements and any other remarks. You either you want to make an abbreviated opening statement. No. Okay. Thank you. With that, uh, as is the policy of the committee, we'll begin by reading the uh, mission statement. I know every city and state have their own mission statement. Here's ours. The Oversight Committee. We exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have the right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers, because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to federal bureaucracy. This is the Commission of Government Oversight Reform Committee. And with that, we go to our first two witnesses, Governor O'Malley. Uh, I'm sure that we could all do a lot of uh, introductions, but quite frankly, I think you're better known than we are here. And, uh, 
Mayor Rowling, Rowling Blake. It's the uh, it's the rule of the committee that all members be te all witnesses be uh, uh, sworn. Would you please rise to take the oath? Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you are about to give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record reflect both answered in the affirmative. It is also tradition on Capitol Hill that uh, witnesses speak for five minutes and then be endlessly asked questions uh, from the dais. We will change that, considering uh, your input. would ask you to uh, remember that your opening statements, your official opening statements, are in the, uh, the record. Uh, however, we recognize you for such time as you may consume government. Mr. Chairman, Chairman said thank you very, very much for ranking on the comments and all the members of the committee. Welcome to, uh, well, I should leave that to the mayor, I can say welcome to Baltimore. I can say welcome to Maryland. It's an honor to the free, home of the brave. It's an honor to be with you and be able to address you on this important, important issue, along with Mayor Stephanie Rawlings Blake. As we make this turn uh, out of the recession and into a new economy, uh, I firmly believe that, uh, as you do, that the building block for our stronger growing class is a family home. It is the, the building block. And there is no more powerful place in our state than a family's home. And the loss of even one home impacts not just entire families, but entire neighborhoods, entire communities, entire cities, entire counties. Home ownership is critically important to our ability to make it in America. And while we are by no means out of this uh, crisis, we still have a lot of people looking for jobs. We do believe that we have been able to do some things that have helped to uh, protect family homes, protect home ownership, and allow many of uh, our moms and dads to be able to get to the other side of this recession. Our foreclosure rate is now significantly lower than the national rate. Last month, Realty Track reported that we have driven foreclosures down 70% compared to a year ago. It is the sharpest decline that any state in the country has been able to achieve over the course of this last year. Uh, and yet, too many of our fellow citizens continue to lose their homes. And as mortgage companies and uh, uh, the, the post-robo signing moratoriums, we are, are uh, very cognizant of the fact that those foreclosures, once again, will start to go up. Uh, with reforms we passed last year, mortgage giants in Maryland are now required to meet with homeowners at the negotiating table before they can throw them out on the street. Uh, they must prove that they've made a full review of mitigation options. This uh, was legislation that we enacted, as I say, just last year. Prior to that, when this crisis hit, we enacted other legislation. In fact, at the time, the Washington Post characterized it as one of the most sweeping legislative packages in America to slow down the fast track to foreclosure. It might have been sweeping, but it was not as effective as we would have liked. So that's why we had to go back again and give every homeowner the right to a mandatory mediation before they can be thrown out of their home. We've now reached agreements with multiple mortgage services to create a streamlined and transparent loss mitigation process. We've assembled a pro bono network of a thousand attorneys called forth by the chief judge of our Court of Appeals, Judge Robert Bell. And we've teamed with nonprofit housing counselors to assist more than 54,000 Marylanders. When the robo signing incident came to light, we partnered with Congressman Cummings and our Attorney General for our state to demand that servicers halt foreclosure proceedings until they rework their practices. And when we and we partnered with our court system, which adopted emergency rules to protect homeowners. We are part of that multi-state effort that is, I uh, believe, joined by all 50 attorneys general. Hope I'll put the right plural in the right place there. Uh, many servicers still do not have the basic systems in place to keep track of um, paperwork to provide timely responses to loan modification applications. Maryland's housing counselors tell us that obtaining even a trial loan modification typically takes six months. Uh, we have taken action at the state level to protect homeowners and hold the national mortgage giants accountable, but we cannot go it alone and we need your help. And to that end, I ask that you, number one, uh, hold mortgage giants accountable. Uh, by fa and we favor the creation of clear and specific national servicing standards. Each one of these modifications shouldn't be some grand mystery started from scratch every time uh, a homeowner is looking for a little relief. 
Number two, housing counseling empowers our most vulnerable homeowners with the tools and the know-how to save their homes. I want to underscore how critically important the dollars have been from the federal government and also our state that we put in to the nonprofit housing counselors. They have acted as mitigation originators, if you will. Uh, and they're critically important. Now is not the time to slash those dollars. Number three, rather than dismantling the imperfect and yet critically important Home Affordable Modification Program, the HAMP program, we believe that it can and should be retooled for greater efficiency, greater transparency, and higher performance. The simple truth is that without access to affordable and sustainable loan modifications, more Americans will lose their homes, slow and recovery. Number four, HUD's Emergency Homeowner Loan Program is projected to help more than a thousand unemployed Marylanders who are struggling to make mortgage payments while looking for work. Uh, we believe that this is another tool that has to be preserved and has to be employed. Number five, community development block grants and, uh, and the neighborhood stabilization program can be the difference between uh, saving or losing a neighborhood in the course of, of these difficult times. So uh, I, I urge you to, uh, to uh, continue your oversight, continue to drive performance. These are programs that should work more effectively than they have worked. Uh, we do believe that we have found the right alchemy of several steps, one of them being the mandatory right to mediation that has greatly reduced the number of homes that we are losing to foreclosure. I thank you again for uh, your attention to this important matter. Thank you, Governor. Mayor. Thank you very much, and good morning. I want to thank uh, Chairman Nessa, Brett, and uh, Ranking Member Cummings, and the members of the committee uh, for allowing me to speak to you this morning. The matters being considered by your committee are of vital importance in addressing the foreclosure crisis facing Baltimore and our nation. I applaud Congressman Cummings and the committee members in holding this hearing to gather test uh, testimony on the importance <coughs> of the mor mortgage service industry that greatly compound this crisis. Let me very briefly outline the scale of uh, foreclosures in Baltimore. Since 2007, some 18,000 properties in Baltimore City have had foreclosures filed against them. All but a handful of neighborhoods in the city have been impacted by foreclosures. Many of our neighborhoods have been impacted severely. Well over one-third of our neighborhoods have had more than 5% of their properties foreclosed against. Many of these neighborhoods that I'm talking about are the bedrocks of our city. Communities comprised of both row homes and detached structures with high occupancy rates and majority homeowners. The foreclosure crisis has imperiled many of these areas. It's not only Baltimore homeowners that have been impacted by foreclosure. Over 40% of all properties that have been foreclosed against in the past four years are rentals. This has led to the extremely unfortunate situation where residents who have paid their rent are at risk of losing their housing. The city's foreclosure rate would undoubtedly be significantly higher had Governor O'Malley administration not taking legislative action that slowed the foreclosure process and improved opportunities for mediation for mortgage holders. Uh, with mortgage holders, excuse me. As foreclosures began to dramatically increase in 2007, city government, in concert with state, federal agencies, and the foundation community, began to increase financial and organizational support to nonprofit entities uh, providing foreclosure counseling. It is through the network of counselors that we became increasingly aware of the abysmal performance of the mortgage service industry in constructively addressing this crisis. Among the many troubling aspects of this performance is, a most, is the almost systematic loss of uh, supporting documentation for loan modifications, particularly stands out uh, as, a, uh, as an error that needs to be corrected. The dedication and professionalism of so many of the housing counselors in this city is to be commended. This is difficult, exhausting work carried out under daunting circumstances. Their perseverance and their unwavering support of homeowners in crisis have helped many Baltimore homeowners avoid foreclosure. Unfortunately, the insufficient efforts on the part of the mortgage service industry um, has many, in many cases, lessened the effectiveness of these counselors. As, concern the, as concerns the abuses being examined by this committee, let me note the following. 
Baltimore households have suffered from virtually all of the abuses. Predatory loans, robo-signing, wrongful foreclosure, failure to properly maintain and file mortgage documents, and false affidavits, all being investigated by this community. Often services have uh, profited handsomely from these abuses. Despite this, they have not employed enough staff to locate and properly process the loan documentation, but routinely file lost note affidavits. Some lenders have steered buyers into loans they could not afford, and then after profiting through initiation fees and points, bundling the loans into uh, mortgage-backed securities and sold them off to secondary market, thus selling off their risk. These predatory lending and service practices cause equity stripping, home loss, and blighting vacancies. These practices not only devastate families, they cost the city millions of tax dollars lost in property tax and transfer tax revenue. As concerns regulatory, regulatory uh, solutions, the committee may examine and I hope consider the following. The real party and in interest should be the named plaintiff in any foreclosure action. Currently, only the trustee or substitute trustee may be, must be named, usually the attorney hired by the servicer. The lack of transparency makes it difficult to understand and document trends in lending and foreclosure practices in our city, thus handicapping our ability to protect our residents. The Home Mortgage Disclosure Act should be amended to require that borrowers' credit scores be reported as publicly available data in addition to the race and other data currently being reported. This will enable federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies to discover and document predatory practices without the burdensome need for instituting a suit or obtaining a discovery. Every document that a foreclosure plaintiff files should be served on the homeowner who is at risk. For example, the report of sale is not served on the homeowner, and it is not uncommon for a homeowner to answer the door and just have a stranger tell them, I just bought your house, and you need to leave. Increased transparency will enable distressed homeowners to better defend their homes and better plan for the future. Increased federal oversight and enforcement is also needed. Uh, much of the subprime ped predatory lending that helped trigger this crisis could have been avoided had there not been lax enforcement of the Fair Housing Act and banking regulations. Again, I want to thank you uh, for being here in Baltimore, a city that has been tremendously impacted by abuses in the uh, mortgage industry. Uh, I, I uh, hope that this um, committee here in the service will be fruitful in your efforts to correct the wrongs. Thank you. Uh, Mayor, uh, I want to particularly thank uh, the city of Baltimore for, uh, for having us here. Uh, and Governor, I'll, I'll start with you. The, uh, the committee uh, has, in, in somewhat to the mayor's statement, the committee has been working to try to create transparency in government uh, on a bipartisan basis. We try to uh, interject open standards into the uh, uh, Dodd-Frank bill that passed last year. We, we failed. Uh, Congressman Frank and others have offered to uh, to help us get it through this Congress. And we intend to get through uh, data standards that would allow for anyone who wants to, wants to give an access either individually or for statistical purposes, to be able to very transparently get all of that information. One of the things our earlier uh, uh, hearings showed us was that, in fact, there is no standard for submission, so that you have to go bank by bank, and unless somebody wants to pay the bill to consolidate uh, all these divergent uh, standards and get, if you will, the credit score lined up between different uh, loan organizations, you're not going to get there. Uh, but, Governor, you mentioned HAMP in your opening statement. As you know, the HAMP uh, program is highly flawed. Uh, by its own testimony, it's not received, it's not getting to its goals, and the servicers make it very clear that the only people that are getting permanent loan modification are people that would get it without the HAMP program, even though it's cost us $30 billion. And yes, we have that on your own. So, my question to you is, as Congress looks at how to spend the next $40 billion of a $70 billion program, shouldn't we consider making HAMP the loan modification of last resort and not first, cause all people to go through and be refused loan modification, and then only if they're unable to get it through ordinary means at the bank's own expense, the bank's or the 
able to come to the government. Have you considered that in order to try to narrow the, the bases down to those who would not otherwise get a loan modification? The, there are no doubt probably other people on the panel who can speak um, with greater, um, with greater uh, awareness of, you know, of situational awareness on the ground. It's my understanding that in the absence of any sort of lender responsibilities or penalties for lender deviation from the HEMP guidelines, that, uh, uh, that, that it's not being maximized to its greatest degree. Uh, the, I, think, well, I think one of the recommendations that, that our staff has is that there be a one-step modification rather than a two-step modification. I, I, I take it the chairman's talking about maybe a third step no, the, uh, Governor, the, uh, currently the servicer gets no money uh, for doing a trial loan modification. It's all on their back. So as they go through the process to decide whether or not somebody could be eligible for a modification, they get no funding, nothing comes out of, of hand. Once they do a permanent loan modification, then that $30 billion uh, that we've obligated comes into play. So in our case, uh, what we're finding is What's most, criti most criticized is the portion that HAMP doesn't pay for, which is the trial modification. Initially, the trial modifications modified everybody. Everybody got in. Later on, they decided that a liar loan, coming back to be a liar loan application, wasn't a good idea. That you should have to, before you get into the first step, have some substantiation that you have real tangible income on which you might be able to have loan modification. So they made changes. But it still comes down to the HAMP is the first step. Everybody goes and says, am I eligible for it, and makes the application. And six months, as you said, or more goes by before they find out, yes, they are or no, they're not. In the meantime, the system is essentially stalled. So uh, I won't belabor the point, but for both of you, uh, uh, as Congress considers uh, changing or canceling HAMP, one of our questions is clearly going to be, you know, should HAMP exist, and if so, should it only apply to those who otherwise would not get a modification versus paying the banks who sit through at about a three to one ratio or so, about three don't get it for every one that does, and then we find that the ones who get it are the ones who would have gotten it anyway. They didn't need a government bailout to, to get it. Uh, Mayor, uh, you mentioned the 40% uh, the of homes, which were basically income properties that have been put through foreclosure. Uh, from your knowledge, uh, do you have a program or can the government have a program that causes those renters money to go to the, uh, to the active home mortgage company? Because I assume that the renters money is being diverted by the, uh, the mortgage holders, the mortgage mortgage. That is, uh, Mr. Chairman, that is something that uh, we've been looking into uh, prior to being mayor with the president of the city council and this issue that we've been uh, working on since that time. So to protect the uh, money that goes, uh, that the renters are paying with no protection. Um, as you can expect, we met significant opposition uh, from the banking industry on, um, you know, who has control over that uh, money. Well, I assume the banks, the banks would love nothing more than for the renters' money not to be diverted so they at least be getting something for the home, where in most cases, actual uh, borrower, once they know they're going into foreclosure, simply keeps collecting the rent and not paying. This is something we ran into in a Cleveland investigation uh, four years ago. The problem, uh, one of the problems that seemed to come up uh, was that uh, the, the banks felt like then they were dealing with two <coughs> mortgage holders, uh, one with no real responsibility to the mortgage, uh, that, the, that while they were dealing with one, mortgage holder that was in default. Um, another one was attempting to pay, and it was not. The, the, uh, the efforts weren't uh, connected. Uh, that there was um, no way for the, uh, you know, if there was money that uh, the originally, uh, the landlord didn't submit, that there could have been a gap, and then uh, the bank wouldn't uh, be able to uh, close that gap uh, if there was some uh, lapse. So I, I would uh, love to hear more about what happened uh, in Cleveland to fix that problem because it is a significant uh, issue in Baltimore City. So if there is a way uh, to um, 
to make sure that the, the, the banks are on board, um, it would be helpful. I appreciate that. Uh, I don't want to monopolize your uh, your knowledge, so with that, I recognize the ranking member for his questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Chairman, I want to just go back to some of the things that you talked about. Uh, the Chairman. Strong. 
Um, you talk about the number of foreclosures. A lot of people don't realize how much foreclosures bring down property values and, and affect a city's able ability to function. Uh, can you just talk about that for a moment? It's significant. There's, there are things uh, that we can measure, like the amount of property tax lost in 2010. We lost almost $14 million uh, due to the foreclosure crisis in Baltimore City, and that's what we can measure. Uh, there's also uh, intangibles, you know, the impact, uh, the continued impact of blighted and vacant properties when uh, these homes uh, go vacant, you know, what that means to a community, how that drags down uh, property values and creates unsafe neighborhoods. We're struggling. Uh, in Baltimore with a significant amount of uh, vacant properties. Uh, investors that come in, uh, purchase properties, and uh, are sitting on them. We're tackling that. And added to that is the uh, issue of the foreclosure crisis and the, the vacancy that, that, um, that that's creating. So you know, it's layering on um, intractable problems. See, my gentleman's started. Thank you, gentlemen. We now recognize the gentleman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Mr. Governor and, and uh, Mayor. Thank you so much for uh, your hospitality and having us here. Uh, I've always enjoyed my time spent in Maryland or Baltimore. And it's good to come back this morning early enough to miss the traffic jams as well. Uh, coming from Michigan, we uh, understand foreclosure as well, economic hard times. Um, Mr. Governor, um, you mentioned in your, uh, your statement uh, several times this morning, your support for HAMP. Uh, and uh, realistically, a government program that isn't perfect. Uh, but in looking at some of the, the figures uh, that I've had in front of me, uh, nationwide, HAMP has resulted in just over 539 permanent modifications as of <coughs> January of uh, this year. But it's also resulted in 808,000 cancellations. Homeowners whose HAMP modifications, and I think this is a significant significant problem. Uh, homeowners whose HAMP modifications are canceled often end up worse than if they had never been part of the program in the first place. Uh, in your testimony, you mentioned the creation of the program of 22,000 permanent modifications in Maryland. How many temporary modifications have been canceled in Maryland? And how many permanent modifications do we have those records have been canceled in Maryland? The uh, congressman, the numbers I had
second quarter of 2010, the most recent period for which results are available, Treasury's agent only disagreed with servicer actions 2.4% of the time. So my question is, do you believe that HAMP's results would improve significantly if servers compliance was better? And how so? Yeah, I, I'm not an expert on the fix. I'm an expert uh, in the, the impact of the problem. You know, I anecdotally have heard so many times in media, uh, community meetings that I go to all throughout the city where people um, feel that their work, they've been working on a modification. Uh, but in essence, it's being dual trapped. So they're, they're thinking that they're working on a modification, but at the same time, uh, aggressive uh, foreclosure is being uh, pursued at the, at the same time. If the, what I mentioned about the, the lost documentation and you know, people really being strung along, these are the things uh, that I know about. Uh, as far as the regulatory fix, I'm sure that they are, uh, are coming to testify um, much more uh, you know, seasoned uh, people that could uh, give you recommendations on the fix. I just I can uh, speak about the problems I hear uh, from my constituents, and um, people are being lied to. They're being uh, given false hope, and they're depending on the uh, the, the word of uh, these financial institutions to the detriment of themselves and their families. And, and as a result to our communities and our city. So that's what I know the, the problem is, and my hope is uh, we can get to a solution. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. If you now recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Kearney, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for having these hearings, and thank you, Mr. Cummings, for uh, having these hearings and doing the work that he's doing on this subject as well. Governor and Mayor, thank you for the work that you're doing. Maryland has done, the Baltimore has done quite well in comparison to an industry that didn't cover itself in glory when it led us into the financial crisis that we're in today, and it's certainly not covering itself in glory as we try to get out of it. Uh, and I understand the HAMP program uh, is not perfect. I'm as frustrated or more frustrated than anybody with its imperfections. The question for us pretty soon this weekend back is going to be whether we leave the banks on their own. We've pretty much seen what that's led to, or whether we try to like, get a system in there that works to help the homeowners. The mayor, like you, Mr. Cummings is on the staff, and I throw all my colleagues' staffs, my staff, Pulling your hair out, trying to help people who come in desperate. Uh, we have a holdover from a previous administration and the head of the Office of Control of the Currency that seems to be more concerned with the banks than he is with the homeowners. Uh, we have the uh, Federal Housing Finance Administration that I think is not doing its job uh, in, in terms of conservation with the Fannie Mae Freddie Mac. If they were, uh, they would insist that there be some write down on some of the principle on that basis that would better protect taxpayer investors than letting them go to foreclosure. So there's a lot of work. Down in this area. Uh, thank you for your efforts. Governor, there are 50 states in Maryland as one of them involved in court action. Uh, and there's talk in the newspapers of the amount of money that uh, banks and services may be uh, forced to come to the table with. Elizabeth Warren, uh, who is the uh, consumer protection advocate, obviously, and just recently appointed by the president, uh, thinks that $20 billion is not enough. Do you have a position on uh, what your state will be arguing in those settlement proceedings as to what ought to be an appropriate amount? Money for the uh, people to come to the table on, or do you not? I, I do not, Congressman. I'll, I'll, I'll left that to the Attorney General. All right, well, do you have a, a feeling of what standards ought to be put in place and what ought to be placed into that lawsuit that these uh, services and banks have to comply with to make this system work better? Uh, I, think, okay. I think that the Attorney General has I suppose you can load up with the with the penalty 
memories and the like, but at the end of the day, I mean, I think there really should be some expectations and some enforceable way to make these mortgage service companies uh, protect consumers, respond to consumers, be able to make the modifications or not make the modifications, and that's what's been lacking in all of this. Fair. Do you have an opinion as to how valuable HUD's program for unemployed uh, homeowners would be? The, the opportunity under the Dodd-Frank Act for them to receive some stipend to carry them through at least 24 months, if necessary, until they get reemployed uh, and until they get able to work again. Is that a factor you're involved in? Any, uh, any subsidy that we can get to help bridge uh, unemployed individuals uh, to employment is helpful uh, in Baltimore. Uh, we, anything. So the, 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 uh, the act that you were talking about for unemployment insurance, all of those things are significant uh, factors in helping people stay in their homes, helping people get to a point uh, where they can uh, get more You know, It takes time. You know, we have uh, programs that work to retrain uh, individuals. We're investing uh, in uh, workforce development, also in emerging technology. You can't walk out of one job and go into another if it requires um, specialized training. So these things are helpful. Uh, they, I just put you on alert. Thank you, Mr. to put you on alert that if the budget process that was a couple of weeks ago put through, you won't have that work for training program to worry about because the $3 billion sliced out of that uh, is going to shut down. We'll run stop shops on that. So Our uh, we've got some work to do on that part as well uh, to help out cities and towns mm -hmm. on that. Uh, which is my main second. Let me just say that I, I think I'm still an advocate and always have been of uh, a cramp down process on this. Until the banks have some incentive to write down some of the principal and treat this thing honestly, uh, we're all going to be in a lot of trouble in this situation. I, my contention is that the bankruptcy judge had the authority uh, to do that and never get to that point that these banks will finally wake up and go to the table uh, and negotiate with these people, but they're not going to do anything voluntarily. I think they've shown that quite clearly. Thank you for that. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for uh, having the hearing. Uh, thank our witnesses. Uh, Representative Cummings has been the leader in Congress and focusing attention on what the impacts are on neighborhoods uh, when uh, we lose that base of homeowners. We've <coughs> spoken quite eloquently about it. Uh, but I also actually think, Mr. Rice, you have a point about the HEMP program. If it's not working, uh, the question is why. And I was interested, Governor, uh, when you testified. You've had success in reducing the foreclosure rate by 70 percent. So you seem to be doing something right uh, that the HAMP program isn't. And when I think about how practically to deal with this, which you all are on the front line of, the bottom line seems to be somehow, some way, there's got to be a, the mortgage servicer with authority to say yes or no. And this is where I think Congressman Tierney's got a point. One of the reasons I have supported the bankruptcy provision is that it's the only way to force a decision. Uh, and it seems that what the big, one of the biggest problems, again, for practical resolution is that mortgages have been issued, then they've been bundled, then they've been sold to investors, uh, and they've been sliced and diced. So some investors who are in the front of the line uh, before prepayment are going to do okay, some at the end of the line won't. Well, the servicer is caught between its obligation to these various owners of the packages of securities that they're mentioning. So they literally don't even have the ability to say yes to a reasonable deal. And unless, in my view, we deal with that so there is a party in the room who can say yes to a good deal, uh, with However much counseling we provide people, it's not really going to work. So the only way I know that that would work is with bankruptcy, and that's a contentious debate within Congress because it does raise some policy questions. Uh, but I've always supported it because it's the only practical way to get from here to there with an answer. And I just want to ask each of you whether uh, that would help you in your efforts to try to stabilize and, and revive these neighborhoods where you've got your citizens doing their best to hang on, Governor? That is on the bankruptcy economy? That's right, just as a tool to well, help you. I think it would be I think it would be very helpful. In fact, had that tool been in place, we would not have had to have put into place a mandatory right to mediation.
Well, those are now handled at the Office of Administrative Hearings in our state, the same entity that uh, provides administrative law judges that preside over uh, right. traffic matters and, and other sorts of regulatory things. But I, I think I, I had uh, I had been of the belief that uh, it was impossible that because of the slicing and dicing, it was nearly impossible to have people with authority in a huge percentage of these. That's not been our experience. And perhaps our banking commissioner or other people who follow in the subsequent panels. I think the bigger problem is not uh, the person who not, uh, is not the lack of authority. It's the lack of, of them being present. It's the, the, the efficiency with which the court system kind of grinds through this foreclosure process versus the thought and the and the staff work required to send someone to actually make a decision. I think they actually have the authority. I think they're choosing not to exercise the authority. And I think so long as they're able to make money simply by churning and postponing any sort of, of reckoning, whether it's a write down of the principal or some other modification, I think they're going to do that. So do you have some suggestions of what some steps we can take at the federal level to help that happen? Because again, I, I think there's some fair criticism of the hand program just can't get to a resolution, uh, then that's a fair prison. Because the goal here isn't just to have another government program. The goal is to help folks stay in their homes. So do you have some concrete suggestions on what we can do that might help you be successful? I, I think the bankruptcy suggestion that both of you have talked about, given the courts the authority to pull them in, I think that would be a, a step in the right direction. I think in the meantime, otherwise you're going to see a different circumstance in every state, and they're just going to kick the ball down the road, hoping that it's better when they wake up and they get a year from now. Thank you. Mayor? I, I agree. And you, I think in your uh, opening, you made it clear, and you made, you made the point, there needs to be someone in the room that has the authority to make the decision, and they're not doing it on their own. Um, I, I think it would be helpful. I, I agree with that. We, we have to give some help to the, the mortgage services if they're caught between uh, competing interests of their various uh, mortgage holders, uh, that if they make a prudent decision in the interest of the overall resolution, that they have some protection against liability by one tranche of the uh, security. I don't know if I've been clear on that. No, no, you've got a mortgage holder, you've got a mortgage servicer, and you've got uh, those, there might be five, six of us up here who each own one tranche, and Congressman Tierney's tranche might be more jeopardized than Congressman Cummings the mortgage servicer settle. So the mortgage servicer is not so much worried about the judge or anyone else, he's worried about getting sued by one of the uh, security holders. And my question is, would it make sense to give some protection, legal protection, uh, to the mortgage servicer so that if they made a prudent financial decision in the overall interest of that security, uh, they wouldn't have to fear uh, retaliation of suit. I think you know, if, I think if you don't, you're not really given the authority. Mm -hmm. if, they, if they're acting or not acting out of fear that they're going to be sued, we're not really given the, the tool. Right. Okay. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, uh, Mayor, Governor. You've been very generous with your time. Do you mind one or two follow up questions? Uh, one of them is for the record. Our committee cannot find one criminal prosecution uh, that we can say this servicer, this mortgage uh, company, uh, as a result of this meltdown after the fact, if you will, has been prosecuted. You know, in the savings and loan, we had bank presidents, all kinds of people who, uh, who went to jail. If you don't mind, uh, if, uh, particularly as governor, if you can enlighten us for the record on, on any prosecutions for the misconduct leading to these loans, because uh, we're not finding them, and it's one of the questions for the committee is, if so much bad things happened on the way, and so many people were misled and so on, leading to them having a mortgage that now is, is ruining their lives. We'd like to know, we'd like to know about any of those prosecutions. We figure if there's going to be prosecutions, it probably would have happened by now. The uh, second one, Governor, mortgage, since you're a graduate of this law school, uh -oh. mortgage law is completely state, right? But mortgage law is completely state. In other words, bankruptcy law is completely federal. We reserve that in the Constitution. But cram downs within mortgage law, recourse, non-recourse, those parts of contractual law are within the purview of the state. And the reason I ask that is, 
you would have the ability to effectively create, for example, a right of a homeowner to match the lowest price at the time of the sale. You'd have that right within the state. So the, uh, the, we, we often, inaction is one of the things we do well in Congress, that the others overreact. So assuming we're going to do the former inaction on bankruptcy reform, don't you have the right to create a mortgage law that would allow the homeowner to effectively get the equivalent of cram down, meaning getting the actual value of the property at the time that it's going to be liquidated, put them first in line so that they, as long as they can go find a new, a new lender, a new source, they'd have, the, they'd have that ability. Because the theory of joint venture that used to be in cram down was eliminated and it's not likely to come back, meaning that when I was in private life, we often had contractors, people building massive uh, real estate structures. They had the theory that if they won, they got the profit. If it lost, the bank shared in the loss. And that was what bankruptcy reform fixed uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, getting back the idea that you're in a joint venture, that heads you get the appreciation of your house and tails you lose, is unlikely, even if we did bankruptcy reform. So my, my real question is, uh, it's kind of an open-ended question, is, don't you have the authority to do more at the state level, some place in which you've shown willingness to do it quicker than the Congress? Well, we're certainly open to doing everything you know, at the state level. I mean, if we see we start ticking up, we'll be back to the drawing board right away. Uh, and I believe that in a crisis like this, unprecedented, maybe only one other time in our country's history, that if our government can't get off its haunches and put on the gloves and get into the ring, home ownership when it's under threat like this, then, then uh, none of us really have any business being in public service if we can't get into the ring and fight for homeowners in this crisis. I agree with you, Governor. Anyone else have a follow-up question? I want to just go back to uh, my colleagues, uh, Mr. Tierney and Mr. Welch. And, you know, it's interesting that um, Mr. Welch talked about a question you, Governor, with regard to getting people
conserve the assets and property of the regulated entity. Uh, they've refused, FIFA has refused to allow Fannie and Freddie Mac to engage in principal reduction. All they basically have to do is turn around to these uh, recalcitrant banks and services and say, we're not going to buy your paper. Can you take care of those homeowners that are in trouble? And they would, in fact, then be better servicing Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, who represents the investor in this case, the taxpayers, which would get more out of a modified loan in most cases. They would have a foreclosure. So I invite you to add your voice uh, to the White House and to the administration, particularly to this, uh, uh, the individual that's heading up FIFA right now, who I thought the president probably ought to show the exit to and find somebody to replace them until they start getting aggressive and start dealing with it. So I'll just add that to the, to the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The gentleman from Michigan. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you uh, for your testimony today. Uh, Mr. Governor, the question I have is, uh, HAMP was designed to assist homeowners whose payments are increased but who still have an income and are able to make payments. You testified today that the face of foreclosures has changed due to joblessness. What solutions to the foreclosure crisis, if any, are possible without a broad-based economic recovery? No, not everything. Everything we hope to do as a nation depends on our recovery. And, and what solutions are you are you suggesting for a broad-based recovery? Broad-based recovery? I believe that we need to uh, balance and move forward at the same time. We can't be the first generation of Americans that irresponsibly refuses to invest in our own time and our infrastructure, not only our highway, our transportation infrastructure, including high-speed rail, but also our cyber infrastructure and, uh, and broadband to connect all of our smaller communities and small businesses with this new economy. I believe we need to invest in the education of our children, and I believe that rather than slashing and cutting research and development in places like NIH, which truly makes us a moral leader of this world, we should be increasing those investments, because in a knowledge-based economy, uh, those are the things that education, that innovation, the rebuilding of our infrastructure, which creates a strong and great economy. How sad, how very, very sad that China invests a larger percentage of its GDP in its infrastructure than we're able to in the United States of America. What a national shame that as fewer of our people are receiving a college education, that we would be slashing Pell Grants and putting college further out of the reach of hardworking middle class families. I think we're better than this. I think we have better days in front of us, but not if we continue to try to hack and cut and slash our way to a better future. It doesn't work like that. If you've ever tried to stay up on a bicycle very long simply by balancing, you're going to fall over. You've got to pedal forward. And that's what we need to do as a country. We need to balance, but we also need to pedal forward. And what would you suggest uh, regarding our current debt crisis that we face in this country? 55% of the deficit uh, by 2019 will have been caused by Bush-era tax cuts that disproportionately benefit the wealthiest 1% of Americans. That 1% now claims a greater <coughs> amount of our nation's wealth than it ever has since, say, 1929. I do believe. So that's 55% of that deficit. Another 13% of the driver is a series of desert wars, which for whatever reasons, we've chosen to finance on debt rather than paying as we go. Uh, so um, an economy that comes back is an important part of attacking that deficit. The other important part of uh, attacking that deficit is to bring into line the spending curves not slamming on the brakes of the recovery and causing us to plunge back through another uh, 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 double dip, but bringing the cost curves into line. It's uh, amazing to me with all the debates uh, that go on in, in Washington, we act like tax cuts for the wealthiest one percent that cost money. They do. Let's get a handle on that, shall we? Social Security's not out of whack. Everybody rattles their sword about Social Security and uh, as if we all need to go back to the days of Coolidge and Hoover. Let's go back to the days of rational, fiscally responsible budget where we don't act like tax cuts for the wealthiest 1%. Don't cost all of our nation uh, a, a lot in terms of our economic uh, competitiveness.
to summarize your solution be to raise taxes? No, that's not my solution, I think, uh, and that's not what I said. Uh, although sometimes it does require a combination of those things. I mean, we are one state, we're, in our state, we're one of eight states that still has a AAA bond rating. And you know what, Congressman? We also have the best schools in America three years in a row. Everyone in our state was willing to pay another penny on their sales tax in order to be the only state over these last four years that went four years in a row without a penny's increase to college tuition for people. You get what you pay for in this world. It's true in the America of our grandparents. It's true in our America. And uh, we owe it to the, the, our kids to uh, not be the, the last great generation of Americans. I think this country is not only worth fighting for, I think it's worth investing in. And uh, I think a majority of the people of this country still believe You know, it's, uh, it's fitting that we should end on, you, pay, you get what you're paid for. Uh, others paid for you to be here today. I want to thank both the governor and the mayor for uh, kindly uh, giving us far more time than we originally scheduled. And with that, we're going to take a five-minute uh, recess. Thank you very much.